So I'm very happy to make this as informal and informative um, and interactive as, as possible. I'm happy to uh, take any questions, comments, uh, et cetera. And we'll actually have a dedicated time at the very end of the formal presentation um, for that, uh, about half an hour at the end. But feel, feel free to raise your hand if uh, you have something that you think of as we're discussing these topics. So what I thought I would uh, cover in the next uh, 45 minutes or so um, is just an entire breadth uh, and range of thyroid health. Thyroid uh, disease comes in many different forms, as you can have uh, imagine. And so what I thought we would cover is the spectrum of hypothyroidism, which is defined as an underactive thyroid. The thyroid is not making enough thyroid hormone. Then we'll move on to cover hyperthyroidism, in which the thyroid is making excess thyroid hormone, the opposite. Um, and then we'll move into thyroid nodules, which are defined as lumps or bumps within the thyroid gland. And then finally end with thyroid cancer. So I hope that covers everything. It would uh, answer everybody's questions. So let's very, very broadly start off with even what is the thyroid gland, right? So uh, let's try this pointer. Um, if you can see, the thyroid gland is this butterfly-shaped gland right in the front of the neck here. Um, and in men, it's usually right below the Adam's apple. Um, so it's fairly easy to find in uh, folks with a prominent Adam's apple. And in large, this is what it looks like here. So it's a butterfly-shaped gland made up of sort of the right side lobe, we call it, a little bridge in the middle called the isthmus, and then the left-sided lobe. It should be a symmetrical looking gland. Um, and you know, fairly small, we say that it weighs about 15 to 20 grams or so. And um, what does the thyroid do? Why do we need it? What is its role in the body? Well, the thyroid gland makes the thyroid hormones, of which there are several um, of them. Um, and thyroid hormones in themselves are needed for maintaining uh, the tissues in the body, things like the heart, um, here, the brain, muscles, um, many other parts of the body. It sort of acts as the fuel of the body, if you can perhaps think of it that way. Um, and so the thyroid hormones are critical for the functioning of the in entire uh, bodily health. And so now let's focus in on hypothyroidism, what happens when the thyroid is underactive. So uh, again, uh, this is defined as when the thyroid is not making enough thyroid hormone. And this is suggested when you go to your physician um, or your provider of a blood test, something called the TSH. This stands for thyroid stimulating hormone. And that would be perhaps the first test in which your provider would order to check um, the response of the thyroid to see if it's making enough thyroid hormones. And what are some of the common causes of why a person might have an underactive thyroid gland? Well, by and large, worldwide actually, turns out that hypothyroidism is due to something called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. You might have heard of this term. It's a little bit of a confusing terminology because sometimes it's referred to as Hashimoto's disease as well. Um, and it is an autoimmune disease. We'll go through it in just a little uh, bit in greater detail. But it is the, by far and large the most common cause of hypothyroidism in the world, an autoimmune disease. Um, secondly, there could be prior thyroid surgery. If you've actually had your thyroid uh, surgically removed for a variety of reasons, you have an underactive thyroid by definition. There could also be um, prior treatment of an, perhaps an overactive thyroid, so hyperthyroidism, with treatments including something called radioactive iodine. Um, we'll go through in greater detail of what radioactive iodine is. Um, if a person had medications used to treat an overactive thyroid, perhaps now that uh, those medications um, uh, are now producing the opposite end of the spectrum, so hypothyroidism. And then there are various medications, and one of them might be something called lithium, which is a medication used to treat um, mood disorders. Uh, that's very common. That in some cases can also be associated with hypothyroidism. So, we talked that Hashimoto, oh, we have a question here. Yes, um, please. What symptoms would you? Um, 
Very good question. So this lady here had a question of what are the symptoms of hypothyroidism. Let me just address that. I think it's in the next slide. Can you hold off on that thought for now? Um, so uh, we talked a little bit of Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is an autoimmune disease. I wanted just to talk very briefly of the difference between something called Hashimoto's thyroiditis and Hashimoto's hypothyroidism. Um, because you might sort of hear these terms being tossed around and sometimes it's a little bit confusing. So I tried to define it very simply here. Hashimoto's thyroiditis are um, positive thyroid antibodies, something like TPO antibodies, which might be floating around in the bloodstream. Very, very common to actually have this. Those antibodies are present in about 15 to 20% of the general population. So perhaps one in five people, one in six people actually have these TPO antibodies um, giving you this disease called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And in most people, this Hashimoto's thyroiditis, the antibodies don't do anything. They're just sitting around in your blood. But in a, a minority of folks, <clears throat> these antibodies can develop something called Hashimoto's hypothyroidism, which is uh, the antibodies uh, giving rise to an underactive thyroid gland. And then this, in turn, is called Hashimoto's hypothyroidism. We have a question here. Ah, good, thank you. TPO stands for thyroid peroxidase antibodies. That's what it stands for. It's one of the more common thyroid antibodies. There are others as well, but uh, it is the most common. So I hope that clarifies a little bit of the difference between Hashimoto's thyroiditis and Hashimoto's hypothyroidism. Um, one leads to the other in some folks. Okay, um, in addition, there could be some other even more rare causes of an underactive thyroid gland. Um, one of those would be congenital disease, so diseases in which you are born with, they're inherited, um, and so babies are sometimes born with hypothyroidism. This would be a lifelong scenario. Um, pituitary disease is also possible. The pituitary gland is a little gland right in the brain, in the middle of the brain, um, and it actually controls the production of the thyroid hormones coming from the thyroid gland in the neck. So if this is wrong here in the brain, perhaps there's no signaling to talk to the thyroid gland in the neck. And in, finally, in certain parts of the world, there could be um, a deficiency of a nutrient, a micronutrient called iodine. Iodine is a common part of all of our foods. You hear about iodized salt. Um, iodine is a common part of you know, certain breads and meats and dairy and et cetera. And in some parts of the world in which um, there might be endemic iodine deficiency, um, perhaps in more mountainous areas, uh, the, that iodine is not uh, sufficient enough to make the thyroid hormones, resulting in an underactive thyroid. The thyroid tries to compensate by enlarging, trying to work over time, and we call this an endemic gorder. Something like this, but this would be very, very pronounced. Obviously, here in the United States, um, we might have more milder forms of this. Okay. Question. Yes. Right, right, right. So this is what I was talking about. The pituitary gland is a little gland right in the brain. It's right behind the eyes, right centrally. And it's a little gland that controls, it puts out a hormone that controls the way that your thyroid um, makes thyroid hormones. But aside from that, that's the only part of the central nervous system in which it is connected. The which? The pituitary gland or the thyroid? The thyroid, again, I don't know if you, you uh, saw this first slide. It's a little gland right in the um, front of the neck here. This is a good picture. Um, right here and enlarged, this is what it looks like. But it's very small, right in the middle um, of the front of the neck, sort of right underneath the chin. The um, it's connected, right? It's connected to uh, the surrounding structures, of course. So um, around it would be the windpipe, um, the esophagus in which you swallow food, um, the blood vessels that supply blood to the brain, um, and there's muscle and fat around that area as well. Thank you for the question. So I think we're about to get to your question, which is the symptoms of what happens when the thyroid is not making enough thyroid hormone. 
And here we go. So these are perhaps some common symptoms of hypothyroidism, an underactive thyroid gland. They're fairly nonspecific, and if you ask, um, people, you know, generally folks might have a little bit of fatigue or weakness, low energy. Again, the, you can think of thyroid hormone as the fuel of the body, and you can imagine like a car, when the car doesn't have enough gas, then you're slow. So um, you might also have some weight gain, hair loss, dry skin, some forgetfulness, constipation, mood problems, leg swelling and problems with cold. So some people might feel that they're more cold than other people in the same room that you are. So um, fairly nonspecific symptoms, like even without thyroid disease, probably one of you already has you know, a little bit of tiredness day to day. Um, and so we always have to check with a blood test to see if these symptoms correspond to the thyroid, right? Okay. And so, how do we diagnose when you have one of these symptoms? Again, we usually recommend a thyroid blood test, something called a TSH to begin with, a thyroid stimulating hormone. And if the TSH is abnormal, then your doctor may also confirm with ordering subsequent tests, things that might include the actual thyroid hormones, T3 and T4, for some confirmation, okay? And, um, if the uh, initial blood test TSH is high, that is suggestive of hypothyroidism. So it's a little bit ironic. When the thyroid hormones are low, then the TSH uh, is increased um, as a result, and that's hypothyroidism. Um, and then the confirmatory tests are T3 and T4, which would be low. Okay, and then remember that the most common cause of uh, th underactive thyroid disease, hypothyroidism in the world, is Hashimoto's disease, that uh, autoimmune disease in which the, the antibodies are around in the bloodstream. Um, if that's suspected, we can actually check for those antibodies. So uh, your question here, that TPO antibody, ooh, sorry, um, uh, uh, here in the blood. So the TPO titer can be checked and measured. Yes, question. About the test, uh, I have my test and uh, the range is very wide. The range is so very what wide. what happens if you are close to the... Uh, like okay, the and are we talking the for the test, are we talking T about the TSH? TSH, T3, and T4. Oh, okay, so yes. Of them, uh, they are in your range, but they are very close to the border line. So if they're in range, we do call that and consider that normal. Um, there's a reason that the range is defined as you know, those parameters. And they're different for every laboratory, by the way. Um, but in that specific laboratory that you got your tests done, if it's normal, we do consider that normal, even if it's borderline. And if somebody has a symptoms and suffering, Right. The, the question is if your yeah. The question is if your tests are borderline, but yet you have some of these symptoms of hypothyroidism, would you benefit potentially from treatment from from thyroid hormone treatment? The answer is generally no, um, because even tests that are so borderline, even borderline abnormal generally you probably wouldn't be feeling many symptoms that are attributed to the thyroid itself. They might be other things. Usually the symptoms are if the blood tests are really abnormal to, to be correlated. <clears throat> Did we have another question back here? I thought I saw a hand. Yes, sir. Can the other autoimmune diseases cause Yes, so that's a very good question. If you have one autoimmune disease, for example, rheumatoid arthritis is a very common one, or type 1 diabetes, vitiligo, celiac disease, these are all sort of um, autoimmune diseases. Do you have an increased risk for developing um, uh, the autoimmune form of hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's? And the answer is yes. The uh, autoimmune diseases like to travel together. Um, so even if you don't have an autoimmune disease in you yourself, if you have that history in your family, perhaps, um, brothers, sisters, um, parents, or so forth, then uh, you are still at slightly increased risk, more than the average person. But 
um, it, it's not dramatically increased, it's just a slightly increased risk. So you should be looking out for that. And I thought I saw one other hand here. Um, yes. Maybe you'll be answering this next, but sure. how would you know if you should ask your doctor whether they suspect you have the autoimmune disease? Oh, I see. Right, right. So it's actually, um, it, uh, um, it sort of depends on the doctor's style, I guess, uh, that you go to. Um, me as an endocrinologist, if I happen to see a person who comes in with an underactive thyroid, I'd like to give you an answer to figure out why you have that. Um, and so I generally do check that TPO antibody. Um, the treatment is still the same, but it's more for just um, perhaps uh, reassurance that it couldn't be really due to anything else. And so common things being common, the Hashimoto's is the most common cause of hypothyroidism. I'd like to prove it in, in, in folks who come to see me. So you would recommend that we ask for it? It can be done, yes. It's very, very commonly done as well. Okay, so let's say that the person does um, have hypothyroidism, they have the symptoms, they get the blood tests that confirm that they are abnormal. So um, when that happens, we do recommend treatment basically replacing uh, the low levels of thyroid hormone with thyroid hormone pills. And so we have some uh, <coughs> examples of what those medications might be. Um, and they are usually uh, in the endocrine community, we do recommend um, T4 replacement. I remember um, earlier I had uh, uh, sort of summarized that the thyroid gland makes two different types of thyroid hormone, T3 and T4. But we generally do, uh, because we have a lot of evidence about the safety and the efficacy of this, recommend replacing with just T4. And those examples, um, it would be generically known as levothyroxine. The brand name available in this country currently is Synthroid. And then there's also another brand called Tyrosint, which is a, a dye-free, so it doesn't have any colors or artificial dyes in it um, in folks who might be allergic to um, fillers and that kind of thing. Um, some patients actually might prefer the combination hormone uh, treatment, um, so that's replacing with both T3 and T4. Um, this is a little bit of a controversial topic. Um, some of you might have heard about or read about this. Um, but the potential danger is that replacing with T3 can um, give you too much of the active thyroid hormone all at once. And when that happens, there's potential damage to revving up the body too fast. So revving up the heart and the bones especially. So um, it's a little bit of a cost-benefit decision that you would have to discuss with your physician of whether or not um, you would want this particular type of replacement. Um, in any scenario, whether or not you take T3 and T4 or just T4 alone, any sort of thyroid hormone when, it, when administered should be taken only on an empty stomach, only with water, no coffee, no juice, no tea or anything like that and preferably 30 to 60 minutes before you eat food, your first meal of the day, perhaps breakfast, um, vitamins or other medications. And the reason for all of these recommendations is that the thyroid hormone pill tends to bind to food and medications and vitamins so that you're absorbing actually less than the prescribed amount. So it is preferable to, to follow these directions to maximize your absorption. Okay, so that was an overview of hypothyroidism. Any questions regarding an underactive thyroid gland before we move to the opposite end of the spectrum? What happens when the body makes too much? Question here. Is um, taking the medication like a lot for the rest of your life? Well, that's a very good question. The question is, do I often always have to take the thyroid hormone replacement for the rest of my life? In general, yes, when the thyroid gland is underactive, it generally doesn't uh, sort of recover and make the uh, amount that was th that is low, um, and so you do rely um, for the benefit of health um, to replace what is uh, not there. So it generally it is a lifelong prescription. Yes, question here. Okay, okay. So let's talk about natural medications. Um, are we talking about natural thyroid hormone or other sorts of uh, question, uh, other therapies? Other therapies. Other therapies, not so much. Um, 
uh, is there a specific one you're wondering about that I can potentially directly address? Uh, a vitamin or okay so some people might be thinking um, when I talked about iodine deficiency in the world um, iodine remember is that micronutrient it's an iodine salt it's in different foods etc um, the thought is if we don't have enough of that micronutrient it's um, perhaps uh, not making uh, it's, it's impairing the thyroid's ability to make thyroid hormone because it is needed in that process. So some folks might think, well, perhaps I can just take some iodine then um, to prevent potentially this problem of an underactive thyroid. I can help the thyroid make its supply of thyroid hormones. In general, we in the US, uh, if we eat a sort of a normal, routine, um, well-balanced diet, we are generally considered not to be iodine deficient in the majority of folks on average. There are some folks in which, you know, uh, for example, um, folks with some restricted diets or very special diets, um, they might be a little bit iodine deficient. And in pregnant and lactating women, those requirements are a little bit different because they are, you know, providing nutrition, nutrition for their fetus as well. But in general, sort of a regular adult healthy adults who are eating a well-balanced meal, we probably are not iodine deficient, such that if you go out and buy some iodine pills or um, think about taking kelp tablets, which have a lot of iodine in them, or eat kelp as a food regularly, you know, in too much uh, quantities, um, the thyroid actually is confused and um, it actually shuts down uh, thyroid hormone production as a result of excess thyroid, uh, excess iodine exposure or ingestion. So for that reason, it could be dangerous to take iodine pills and we would not recommend that. Unless it's part of a multivitamin in uh, the amount that is generally recommended by the FDA, which is 150 micrograms of iodine a day. But if you go out and buy dedicated kelp or iodine tablets, that's going to be much more than that dose. I saw a hand here. Yes, sir. Is the prescription strength of like Synthroid or Levothyroxine yes. too high? Does that cause problems? Yes, you can imagine. This is a hint of what we're going to address next. If we are replacing your thyroid hormone, um, you know, not to just back to where it was before, but over replacing with too high of a dose, perhaps unintentionally, um, then you run into the problem of hyperthyroidism, which is the next topic, excess thyroid hormone. And there could be ramifications, adverse health effects there as well. We'll discuss those briefly. Yes, question here. Um, after the hour of taking thyroid replacement, if one eats high fiber, such as a quarter cup of flaxseed, does mm -hmm. that interfere with the absorption? Right, so the question is, what if I wait the full hour that's recommended um, before uh, I go ahead and eat or take other sort of supplements? Um, the, the concern uh, is lessened, uh, but I don't think it's ever been studied specifically for each of these things. It's only been studied for different medications, specifically calcium, iron, soy, uh, you know, sort of more common things. Flaxseed is a little, a little bit separate. It's a smaller niche. So that I don't think has been studied. Um, but uh, the thought is they do interact with those other things such that we, in general, recommend some separation of time just in case it, it does interact. Is, is an hour adequate? An hour is probably adequate. Um, you know, uh, some folks, they uh, recommend and uh, depending on your your provider they might even recommend two hours um, practically speaking it's a little bit difficult I find to tell people to wake up so early before they you know are ready to eat breakfast um, some people even set an alarm clock and then you go back to sleep which is I feel like you know so burdensome um, so I just say one hour would be sufficient and if you do that consistently and there's some sort of interference with, say, your first meal, then your blood test will reflect that and your provider can intentionally give you a little bit extra to overcome that. So as long as you're consistent, I think that is okay. The problem is when you're doing different things every day. <laughs> and I saw another hand here. Uh, do you recommend buying salt with iodine or without iodine? 
Very good question. I love iodized salt. And everyone should be using only that because it is part of that um, recommended dietary allowance, the daily allowance of 150 micrograms a day. If we're eating, again, a well-balanced diet that includes iodized salt as well as you know, other things that you might be eating in smaller proportions, eggs and bread and meat and dairy and all that sort of stuff, it should about add up to that 150 micrograms. Um, so if a person was not cooking with iodized salt, and by the way, uh, kosher salt as well as uh, some of these gourmet salts, uh, sea salt, Himalayan salt, etc., cetera, um, they are actually not, um, they do not contain any iodine. Iodine has to be fortified and added to iodine in order to be iodized. It does not come naturally. Um, and so over the long term, you know, day to day would be probably okay one day at a time, but over the long term, if you're not cooking with iodized salt, you could potentially be at risk for low. Um, and that's been shown actually even here in this country. I think the question was, uh, okay, you so got to... Uh, uh, I mean, like okay, this. so actually that's a very good question. I'm glad you asked that. Can we measure the amount of iodine in our body yeah. to suggest are you, you know, a cooking with enough iodized salt or taking enough foods that have enough iodine? It's unfortunately not reliable to do this on an individual basis, person to person. Um, and we can, you know, there are ways to measure it through the blood and the urine, both. Um, but it's really not reliable in any one person because of the differences day to day of the foods that we eat that contain iodine. So that if you measure your urine, for example, for iodine, it will just be a reflection of what you ate yesterday. So it would be an artificially low or high or normal result. Blood, same thing. Blood is even worse. <laughs> so what we do in terms of sort of more research questions is we do measure um, across the board the general population, the public. Uh, we measure everybody's urine and everybody's blood. Or not so much blood, actually. Everybody's urine. And on average, we can say that this country is generally iodine sufficient. And we can measure it, obviously, in different age groups and genders and ethnicities, races, sort of identify who might be more susceptible to iodine deficiency. But large surveys that have been done even in the uh, last 40 years now, they've been longstanding across the country, show that we are right on the border of being iodine sufficient. We are OK as a group. Thank you for that question. Thank you very much. Yes. And are, so how often should we be having blood testing? Is this in a person who is already being treated with thyroid hormone? So OK, this is a good question. Um, th the dose of thyroid hormone, whether or not it's levothyroxine or synthroid or tyrosine, is based on your body weight. So you can imagine if your weight goes up and down a lot, then your dose requirement would change as well. If you're maintaining a sort of generally same um, an unchanged body weight, then your dose shouldn't really change and your blood test should reflect that as well. Um, so I would only probably recommend once a year at most unless there are some big body weight changes throughout that time. Or if you're suspecting malabsorption because of you know, um, some stomach problems, uh, anything when you, which you're suspecting that you're really not absorbing the full dose. Okay? So let's, question here, yes. No, no, this is a, a question that's near and dear to my heart. I study this a lot. Um, iodine, the food sources, and by the way, the, the majority of, of iodine exposure really is through the diet, unless you're taking it through medications that are prescribed. So you can't get it from um, other sorts of ways. It's not uh, made naturally in our body. So we're thinking about dietary sources. Iodine salt is by far the most uh, stable and guaranteed route uh, of getting iodine nutrition, uh, enough iodine nutrition in us. Um, and this is a worldwide phenomenon. There's something called universal salt iodization, efforts made globally to decrease the risk of hypothyroidism worldwide. This has been going on for many, many decades. 
Yeah. But other foods, um, if, you know, for example, that are iodine rich or, uh, and this is a result of the natural, just coastal and glacial patterns of the earth, iodine is more commonly found in more coastal water areas. So um, you can imagine seafood, sea products in general have perhaps a little bit more iodine, so fish, shellfish, etc. Um, but otherwise, it's just been added to dairy and bread products. So those industries are now fortified uh, with a little bit of iodine as well, but in varying amounts. How much salt do you need to take in order to get the Oh, okay. So and I'm not actually advocating that you take extra salt because of obviously the, the concerns of high blood pressure in this country and, and worldwide. We don't advocate for people to use extra salt. But I, I do recommend if you are going to use any salt or cook with it or add table salt to your food, if you're going to do that anyways, then at least use iodized salt. Um, but it's not a, a prescription or a, a something extra that I would recommend taking um, you know, in addition to what you're normally doing. Instead of salt, if we have kelp, how much kelp? Well, so I, I was trying to answer this question earlier. Um, yeah. Kelp is probably uh, too variable to give you an answer of how much iodine it contains. And this, you can imagine, is because kelp naturally contains iodine, right? It's in the sea, just like fish and all this or the, the other seafood. So each batch, each, each plant, each kelp stem uh, or you know, leaf has different amounts of iodine, leaf to leaf to leaf to leaf. Oh, That's been proven. Oh, supplements. Okay, so ground up kelp into a little tablet. How much should you take? I wouldn't recommend that at all, unless it's only 150 micrograms, as I was saying, which is the US Food and Drug Administration, the FDA uh, re recommendations for normal health uh, a day. But I guarantee you the supplements that are ground up kelp into the little tablets contain much more than 150 micrograms. They're on the order of maybe 10, 20, 30 fold higher than that. Um, so probably a little bit dangerous. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna move on to hyperthyroidism and we can come back to some of these questions if they come up later as well. So hyperthyroidism is the opposite end of the spectrum. What happens when your body is making too much thyroid hormone? So again, um, that's uh, too much thyroid hormone is made is the definition of hyperthyroidism. And in contrast to hypothyroidism, we again always start with a blood test called TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. And um, in the sort of opposite scenario, this time that TSH blood test will be too low, okay? To suggest that the thyroid hormones are too high. Um, what are some of the causes of hyperthyroidism? Um, it's also an autoimmune disease is the answer here. So this time, it's something called Graves' disease, um, which accounts for about 70% of all causes of hyperthyroidism and overactive thyroid gland. Um, uh, this is uh, just here in the United States. Uh, sorry, worldwide. <laughs> and it is overproduction of thyroid hormone by the entire thyroid gland. So again, um, here's a picture, perhaps, of what the thyroid gland looks like in the front of the neck. Um, this disease is an autoimmune disease in which those antibodies in the blood are attacking the entire thyroid gland to make extra thyroid hormone. Um, and in reference to this person's question previously, just like any other autoimmune disease, having Graves' disease puts you at slightly increased risk for developing other autoimmune diseases either in yourself or your immediate family members. So examples are type 1 diabetes, vitiligo, celiac disease, pernicious anemia, rheumatoid arthritis, a bunch of other um, autoimmune diseases. Other causes of hyperthyroidism. Um, you can actually have a situation of what we call toxic thyroid nodules. These are also known as hot nodules or autonomous thyroid nodules. And what it is, is remember when I told you previously, like Graves' disease was stimulation of the entire thyroid gland to make the extra thyroid hormone. This is a situation in which you have a one or more lumps, for example, this one here, um, in the thyroid gland that it itself alone is making the extra thyroid hormone. The surrounding area is normal. Um, and you can have more than one thyroid or uh, one toxic or hot or autonomous thyroid nodule as well. You can have multiple of them doing all the same thing. 
And the treatments are a little bit different between Graves' disease and these toxic thyroid nodules. Um, other causes, um, sometimes the thyroid might be temporarily inflamed um, from a variety of reasons, perhaps a virus uh, or other things. Um, and so the amount of thyroid hormone that is already in the thyroid leaks out as a result of this inflammation, and you have a situation of temporarily high thyroid hormones in the blood, right? Uh, this is something called thyroiditis, this thyroid inflammation. Sometimes it can be permanent, but most oftentimes it is transient and it will self-resolve. Now, we talked a lot about iodine for hypothyroidism. Just like hypothyroidism, just in contrast to hypothyroidism, having excess iodine exposure, either through the diet or other uh, methods, might predispose and increase your risk of developing hyperthyroidism. Again, it's a nutrient required for thyroid hormone production. So, uh, sources of excess or extra iodine might be CAT scans or radiology procedures because in order for them to do the CAT scan, um, it, you know, for other reasons, perhaps, you know, a CAT scan of the stomach or something, they do need to inject dye, usually in the bloodstream through the arm. That dye happens to have a lot of iodine in it. So that's just a needed procedure, but it is one source of too much iodine. And even if it happens once, that can potentially give rise to some problems. Um, cardiac catheterizations are another type of procedure where with the dye that they use to do that cardiac catheterization, um, even a one-time exposure exposes the body to a lot of iodine at once. And we talked a lot about kelp and iodine supplements. The brands that are commercially available out there generally contain way too much iodine. It's not that 150 micrograms a day that is recommended. So in generally, we consider them probably unsafe. Okay, symptoms of hyperthyroidism, it's as if the body has too much energy, too much gas in the body, so everything is in overdrive. Everything is happening too fast, too rapidly, so too much energy, you might be anxious, you might have a lot of weight loss because you're just running around too much. Fast heart rate, you're feeling more warm than other people in the same room. Loose stools, diarrhea is possible, shakiness, tremors, you know, people uh, sometimes I see with a fine tremor with their outstretched hands, um, and trouble sleeping. So these are just some of the common symptoms of hyperthyroidism. Okay, we talked a little bit about Graves' disease. Again, it's the most common cause of hyperthyroidism is that autoimmune disease where the uh, antibodies in the blood are attacking the thyroid gland to make the extra thyroid hormone. Um, specific to Graves' disease, there is um, some symptoms that we can potentially look out for and pay more attention to. The first is also an enlarged thyroid, something called a goiter, and this is because the thyroid is making excess thyroid hormone. There's a lot of action going on right here in the neck. Temporarily, while the hyperthyroidism is not treated, it's un untreated yet, you can have thyroid enlargement like this or even in milder forms. Secondly, those same antibodies that are floating around in your blood attacking the thyroid gland to make the Graves' disease can also attack the back of the eye, interestingly. So just in this form of hyperthyroidism, Graves' disease, some folks might have thyroid eye disease, and this can be manifest, I think I'll show you a couple more examples uh, next slide, is that uh, folks might have some itchiness of the eye, irritation, redness, bulging of the eyes, they just appear bigger um, than perhaps when you didn't have the Graves' disease, tearing, uh, people often talk about this feeling of grittiness in the eye, like there's sand that you just can't get out that feeling in the eyes. Those are examples. And then just like other autoimmune diseases, there could be other autoimmune diseases either in yourself or the family member. Okay, this is a little bit about Graves' eye disease, just in a little bit more detail. It is only specific to this form of hyperthyroidism. And these are some of the symptoms I alluded to previously, the bulging, the itchiness, et cetera. These are some examples of photos of more extreme cases of Graves' eye disease. Interestingly, if you have this, it is worsened, made worse by cigarette smoking. 
So in folks that I do see with Graves' eye disease, I try to counsel them to at least stop or decrease smoking significantly to make the eye disease better. Um, and in severe cases, or even in more milder forms, I would probably recommend referral, and I work directly with a few folks at UCLA um, in the Jewel Stein Eye Institute um, who specialize specifically in thyroid eye disease, and it can be treated in, in various ways. Um, okay. Um, what are the risks if we keep hyperthyroidism untreated? What is the risk of having too much thyroid hormone? Um, I think I talked about this previously when we were talking about levothyroxine and Synthroid, but when a person has too much excess thyroid hormone in their body, um, there's almost you know, a situation of too much gas. Your, your body is revved up, and specifically, um, it would potentially have bad effects on the heart. It makes the heart go faster, stresses it out more, as well as it depletes the bone because the thyroid hormone wants to suck out the calcium from the bone, making it weak over time. Um, potentially, this can happen more acutely in the short term or over the long term, depending on how long the extra thyroid hormone has been around. Um, and so uh, these are just some examples of uh, irregular heart rhythms and that osteoporosis weak bones, which might occur as a result of hyperthyroidism that's untreated. Okay, so how do we diagnose? We always, again, begin with a serum TSH, a thyroid stimulating hormone blood test. If that is abnormal, then your physician might confirm with measurement of the actual thyroid hormones themselves, so the T3 and the T4, everything is by blood tests. Um, and in some instances, uh, in contrast to hypothyroidism, for hyperthyroidism, we actually might pursue some imaging. And this can be either by an ultrasound, which is a little movie of the thyroid gland on the outside, or a nuclear scan that I'll show uh, a little in greater detail in the next few slides. Um, so uh, TSH is the first test again, um, but know that there are some caveats. If, a, if your physician tests you for that TSH and it is low, suggestive of some sort of hyperthyroidism, excess thyroid hormone, just know that there could be other things that actually lower the TSH that is not hyperthyroidism. So it's sort of important to do a little bit more investigative work in the situation. Um, so recent illness, if you had a big cold or a virus or some sort of um, uh, acute illness that can temporarily lower your TSH blood tests, which would resolve when the cold is over, um, or certain medications, specifically prednisone, hydrocortisone, all these are steroids, which are very common for um, inflammation or asthma or arthritis, a person might be on prednisone for a long time, um, and that can temporarily decrease the TSH blood test as well without having this type of hyperthyroidism as the, as the real problem. So we would probably recommend confirmation with those T3 and T4 actual blood tests to figure out a little bit more what the scenario might be about. Um, and then, just like Hashimoto's for hypothyroidism, for this uh, hyperthyroidism, when the, an autoimmune phenomenon is suggested, like Graves' disease, we can also check those same antibodies. So we not only check in this scenario the TPO, thyroid peroxidase antibodies, but specifically for Graves' disease, we can check for those antibodies are directly attacking the thyroid gland, and those are called TSIs, or thyroid-stimulating immunoglobulins. And this is, a picture, uh, this is an example of that first type of picture I was talking about, the thyroid ultrasound. Um, we might do this as a way just to see what is going on. You know, we talked about Graves' disease as um, the entire thyroid gland being stimulated to make excess thyroid hormones. Sometimes there's a little lump, a thyroid nodule, that toxic thyroid nodule that's making the thyroid hormones. We'd like to structurally see if that little lump potentially was there. So this is one way to do it very quickly, non-invasively, painlessly. It is just a little probe, just like this person has on the left side, um, taking a little movie on the outside of the neck. We do it just at the same time in our office at UCLA. Um, and this is an example of what that picture shows. Um, here is a very normal thyroid gland. Uh, this is the right side of it, the little bridge, and then extending here into the left side. So it gives us a lot of information very, very quickly. And sometimes um, when 
piecing together the blood tests and the thyroid ultrasound, we still can't figure out what is the reason for the hyperthyroidism. Your physician might recommend something called a thyroid nuclear scan and or uptake. What this is, it's a separate test done uh, by appointment uh, in usually a radiology department. Um, the person takes a small tracer radioactive iodine pill, comes back four and 24 hours later after taking the pill, and this technologist here um, has the person sit here and is able to take another picture from the outside to see how much of that radioactive iodine is incorporated into the thyroid gland and what sort of pattern. So it's also a very, very helpful test sometimes in the setting of hyperthyroidism. The treatment, okay. So now, oh yes, question. Uh, what is the dosage of this test of the radioactive? So this is just the, <laughs> excuse me. This is just um, the radi uh, radioactive iodine I, test, I just, just for the, um, just for the, the uptake and scan for diagnosis, is that correct? Yeah, how yes. It's very, very small. So for this test itself, it's on the order of one or two or three millicuries of radioactive iodine. It's essentially called a tracer dose because it's very small. It goes right in and it comes out in the next one or two days. So it's much smaller than uh, the treatment. MRI, MRI test with the dye. The what test for the dye? Oh, oh, it's a different sort of dye. It's, it's not the same dye as an MRI or a CAT scan. This is just for the thyroid. No, no, I understand. Oh. Dosage. Well, for an MRI or a CAT scan, they, the person wouldn't be taking a radioactive iodine pill. It's a different dye altogether is, is what I'm trying to say um, for a CAT scan or an MRI. This radioactive iodine pill, it, it's, different. it's different altogether. It's, oh. it's a different substance. Okay, thank you. Very yes. Question. Yes. Very good question. Is there any danger or side effects or symptoms from taking this test, this diagnostic test? The answer is no, unless you are pregnant or breastfeeding, um, because we don't want to expose the baby to even any small, small doses of radiation in that setting. But for the normal person taking this test, taking that radiation pill, it will go out of your body in the next one or two days, even a few hours. Um, and it is really beneficial in order to see what's going on in the body. So um, we generally do recommend it when we can't figure it out from the combination of the blood test and the ultrasound without any real harm, long-term harm. Okay, let's move on to treatment. So in this um, setting, we have excess thyroid hormone. But there's three options to remove that excess thyroid hormone. First, we can give you medications to actually slow down the thyroid, to actually have the thyroid itself um, emit less thyroid hormone. Second would be surgery. We can actually remove directly by resection the entire thyroid gland, to get rid of the whole problem immediately. Um, or radioactive iodine. We talked a little bit about radioactive iodine for the scan. This is a much larger dose in which the radiation is permanently able to get rid of the thyroid gland. Um, so it's a, a different order of dosage altogether, okay? So let's go through each of these. Um, the pills first, so medications. The effect is really just to slow down thyroid hormone production. Examples of these medications here in the United States is Mifimazole, uh, brand name is Tapazole, or purple thyroguracil, it is often commonly abbreviated PTU. And um, we sometimes see remission in folks that take these medications. Uh, remission is defined as the ability for the thyroid um, to not require any more treatment because the set point of too much thyroid hormone is now normalized back to um, uh, reference levels. So that's achievable with medications at about 20 to 30 percent over um, one or two years. Um, it does usually take one or two years for um, uh, potential treatments to be realized, and that is the maximum amount of time that we would probably recommend methimazole or propylthyrosol because there's some associated side effects with these medications. Those include rash. The rash is usually not dangerous, not life-threatening, 
but in more severe forms, it would prevent the person from continuing to take the medication. We'd have to think about one of these other treatment forms. Also, there could be liver damage. Um, uh, this is usually uh, more rare um, and mild, um, and it really outweighs the cost of, unless it's very, very severe uh, of these treatments. There uh, could be a scenario of low white blood cell count. This is very, very rare with these medications, but when it happens, and this is defined as a weakened immune system, no white blood cells is, uh, prevents you from having an intact immune system. Um, it's on the order of about 0.4% of people who take these medications, um, but you can imagine that this is a potentially very, very serious side effects. Um, and so whenever I prescribe these medications, I tell patients, if you suspect that you have a low white blood cell count by having a really high fever or the worst sore throat of your life, stop the medication and call me immediately so that I can actually measure the white blood cell count for you. Um, again, very, very rare, but because it does potentially happen, we don't advise patients to take this more than 18 to 24 months before now considering, to, uh, considering another type of therapy. So what might that be? Um, we can also consider something called radioactive iodine, as we talked about before. It is a radiation pill, something called I-131, and its job is to destroy thyroid cells, potentially just the overactive cells, but also normal thyroid cells as well, slowly over the course of taking it after you know several months or so, six, seven, eight, nine months, sometimes even is possible. Um, it is a single pill that you would take. It looks like this here. Um, you wouldn't have to usually require repeat treatment unless the dose is not enough, which would be very rare. Um, it, because it is radiation, and you know everyone has some concerns of what radiation might do, there are some safety precautions that are recommended, uh, sort of in the first few days, even up to a week following the ingestion of this radioactive iodide pill. Um, most of the radiation is immediately eliminated through the body, through the bodily fluids. So the sweat, the saliva, the tears, the urine, et cetera. So all of it, uh, not all of it, uh, most of it is, is rapidly uh, eliminated. And the remaining amounts um, are then just sitting in the thyroid for several months to get rid of that excess thyroid hormone. But because it is excreted through a lot of these bodily fluids, um, uh, we, we do want to limit exposure to you know, folks that might be living with you, especially pregnant women or little children in whose thyroids might be still developing. Uh, we want to limit exposure to those folks for at least a few days or even weeks. Potential long-term side effects. <coughs> so um, if uh, the treatment gives is, is sort of too strong, um, and too much of even normal thyroid tissue is destroyed, you can imagine then you will end up in a situation of what we talked about initially, the underactive or hypothyroidism. Um, and that can be permanent uh, in some cases and may require thyroid hormone replacement, just like in those initial scenarios. Um, and then some folks often uh, are concerned about the effect of radiation on developing other cancers the chance of this is quite small, especially in doses that we would use to treat hyperthyroidism. They're much smaller than thyroid cancer doses. Um, and so the, generally this is not thought to be uh, a large issue. But um, in general, if one was really interested, there is a, perhaps a slightly increased chance of developing a second cancer from the radiation. Not a second cancer, a, a cancer from the radiation. Um, and the most common one, if we had to pick one, would be something like a blood cancer, a leukemia. Very, very rare um, for that to happen. And then thirdly, the third mechanism is thyroid surgery. We can actually get rid of the thyroid by resection to get rid of the source of the extra thyroid hormone. We can consider this um, if a person is maybe allergic or can't take the medications for some reason, or they just don't prefer that radioactive iodide treatment route. Um, it's best performed by a surgeon um, with a, a high volume of experience and a center um, that does that frequently. And at UCLA, we do. I work with plenty of wonderful thyroid surgeons who do this very, very often. 
Um, but there is potential damage to uh, the parathyroid glands, which are not related to the thyroid at all. They just happen to have a little bit of the same name. But the parathyroid glands are two, four little glands, two on, uh, on, on the right side and two on the left side. Um, and they control the way our body uses calcium. So if one of or more of the parathyroid glands might be temporarily irritated because the surgery got too close to it or accidentally removed, then your body might have a hard time controlling calcium for the rest of your life, potentially. Um, sometimes it is temporarily. Um, and also the vocal cords are sort of in that area right next to the thyroid gland so that thyroid surgery, if it gets too close to those vocal cords, also might impair voice giving you hoarseness that might be temporarily uh, there or permanent. Um, but these complications done in a very high volume good center should be really less than 1% of all the thyroid surgeries. So done very, very safely. Um, question. Oh, how is surgery done? No, no, surgery is literally surgery. Surgery is using, a, make an incision with a knife, usually about one or one and a half inches, right at the area of the thyroid, so in the front part of the neck, um, and out comes the thyroid gland. It's a surgery that takes about an hour or two, uh, with an, usually associated with an overnight stay. Um, but no, no lasers, it's, it's a true surgery. <laughs> so um, it's less risky if the hyperthyroidism, the excess thyroid hormone is somehow controlled in a way before going into the operating room uh, because we don't want the body to be stressed with this extra thyroid hormone. So generally, I do try to give you a little bit of that um, antithyroidal medication, the methimazole or the propothyuracil before surgery, even if surgery is the route that we decide to take to calm the body down. And because you will have no thyroid gland remaining after it's taken out, you will um, most definitely have permanent hypothyroidism, the need to replace with thyroid hormone for the rest of your life, okay? Okay, um, and then, so we talked about three different treatments for hyperthyroidism, the medications, the radioactive iodine, and the thyroid surgery. What type of treatment sort of depends really on a discussion between you and your endocrinologist. Um, and it might depend on several factors, things like your age, um, the cause of the hyperthyroidism itself, the severity of the disease, other medical conditions which might be um, at play, and then perhaps your personal preference. Um, and then so you should really discuss the pros and cons of each of these treatments with your endocrinologist. Just by way of um, interesting fact, hyperthyroidism or excess thyroid hormone is the most common um, endocrine and thyroid condition in cats. So if you have any kitties who are taking methamazole, not uncommon. <laughs> I thought I'd just throw that tidbit in there. Okay, so any questions about hyperthyroidism before we move on to thyroid nodules? Yes? If somebody has all the symptoms that you show for hyperthyroidism, and yet it's close to the borderline yes. Uh, okay, so what, it, what the question is, what if you have mild or borderline hyperthyroidism? Yes. Is that the but scenario? All the symptoms, no exception. Uh, oh, so all the symptoms, and are the blood tests uh, confirmatory? That are the blood no, tests no, showing? No, the symptoms oh, okay, so for both hypo and hyperthyroidism, the blood test really has to match your symptoms. The symptoms can be from so many other things besides thyroid disease. So. Those symptoms are a clue that you might have thyroid dysfunction. You really do have to confirm with the blood test to show that it is the reason for the symptoms. So if you have a lot of symptoms, they could be from something else altogether. And it's a, high, it's a borderline to the high. It, it means it's getting worse. And I'm thinking before getting completely sick, what is the prevention? Because uh, the range is, is getting worse. So I, 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 if I'm understanding correctly, you're, you're developing more and more symptoms suggestive well, of hyperthyroidism? Same, but the uh -huh. blood tests. Oh, the blood okay. tests are getting worse. I see. I see. So irrespective of the symptoms, what if the blood tests are trending toward hyperthyroidism? Yes. Ah. So this would be, have to be an uh, in individual discussion with you and your physician. It sort of depends on your overall health and other conditions in which you want to actually prevent the 
um, setting of true hyperthyroidism. So perhaps you might treat earlier than waiting until that point because of perhaps stress to your heart or your bones that you want to avoid. So yeah, it would be an individual discussion with your, with your physician. Let's talk now very differently on a different topic about thyroid nodules. We're not gonna talk about thyroid hormones anymore. So a thyroid nodule is defined as a lump um, in the thyroid gland. And um, it's perhaps shown here, you can perhaps feel it uh, either in you um, or your physician can palpate it if it is large enough. Um, the thyroid function is usually normal in this situation. So unlike the previous uh, scenarios of an underactive or an overactive thyroid gland, this is usually just a little lump that's sitting in there and not doing anything to the production of the thyroid hormones. It just happens to be literally a mass, a little ball sitting in the thyroid gland. Very rarely, you can have a situation, remember how I talked about toxic thyroid nodules or hot nodules or autonomous thyroid nodules. That little lump can be making excess thyroid hormone as one scenario, but usually it's not doing anything. Usually it's just sitting there not making extra thyroid hormone and it's definitely not making the thyroid underactive. Okay, so the best test to see this little lump, this little thyroid nodule, is usually a thyroid ultrasound, that same test that we looked at previously for hyperthyroidism. Again, it's non-invasive, there's no radiation involved. This is frequently done here exactly at the same time you come in and you can do it exactly in the same office visit even. Um, this is a picture of what a thyroid ultrasound machine looks like. And again, it's just a little movie taking a picture of the thyroid from the outside. Um, okay, thyroid nodules. If that nodule or that lump becomes large enough or is large enough to warrant some sort of suspicion for thyroid cancer, then we would probably recommend putting a little needle into that lump or nodule to confirm if it is or is not thyroid cancer. So that's called a thyroid nodule biopsy. Um, and if the biopsy comes back, the results show that it is, or at least is even suggestive of thyroid cancer, then thyroid surgery is recommended. Question? Does the doctor order this procedure? Uh, it depends on the endocrinologist you go to. Um, certain endocrinologists do the biopsy right then in their office along with the ultrasound at the same time, and I'm one of those folks. Um, here at the Endocrine Center at UCLA, everything is all one-stop shopping. <laughs> so one visit will um, help hopefully take care of everything, but in some offices, it might be referred to a radiologist, which would be a separate appointment, probably on a different day. Um, okay, also, um, if the biopsy results come back even not cancer, totally normal, meaning it's a benign, non-cancerous lump in the thyroid, if the lump or thyroid nodule is big enough, surgery still might be recommended because it could be interfering by its physical presence with your swallowing, your breathing, your talking, um, other sorts of things that might be there. Um, and if it is small enough, we biopsy it and it's not a cancer, we would just follow it with an ultrasound every so often, probably every year or two, to make sure that its size has stayed the same. Okay, so this is what a biopsy is, just in a little greater detail. We usually recommend biopsies or putting a little needle into the thyroid nodule when it uh, is reaching a size of at least one or one and a half centimeters, sort of like a little small mini grape or so, um, depending on the level of suspicion from the picture itself. We can also use the picture to see how suspicious it is. It's not just the pure size we are measuring, but we can look at its color, blood flow, the presence of some calcium deposits in the thyroid nodule that would maybe increase our level of suspicion a little bit more. Um, a biopsy is not recommended for nodules or lumps that are purely cystic or fluid filled because you can imagine there's no cells in such a structure um, and the risk of cancer is essentially zero. It's literally just a little water balloon, a lump that's sitting in your neck. So for these sort of structures, no matter what size, generally we don't recommend a biopsy for those. Um, and more recently, in the past few years, um, 
when we do the biopsy itself and we send it to the pathologist for them to look at uh, the cells underneath the microscope, we can also now offer in some centers molecular marker testing. So this is using the same biopsy sample that you use, uh, um, that you extracted with the needles itself, and send it for genetic testing to see if there's some sort of mutation genetically that would um, suggest that your thyroid cancer risk in that nodule might be a little bit higher or lower if that result comes back in the middle, indeterminate. You can't really say if it's cancerous or benign, non-cancerous. So in those borderline results, molecular marker testing um, is offered um, and perhaps beneficial. Okay, and if you have more than one thyroid nodule, multiple thyroid nodules, um, they should really receive the same evaluation as if you had a single solitary thyroid nodule. So for example, in this picture, a person has two separate lumps or thyroid nodules. Each should be evaluated separately for its separate chance of thyroid cancer. Um, okay, all right. And by the way, um, I don't know if I'll address this later, I forget, but um, in any single nodule, the risk of thyroid cancer is quite low. The majority of these are benign and not cancerous. Only about 10% or even up to 15% at most is an underlying thyroid cancer. So I just want to reassure everyone because very common to have thyroid nodules, but the majority of them are not cancerous, okay? Okay, so now let's talk a little about thyroid cancer specifically. Um, it is the most common cancer within endocrinology. There's different sort of subtypes, classifications of what the thyroid cancer can be. The most common by far, uh, making up about 80, 85% of all thyroid cancers is something called papillary thyroid cancer. Risk factors for all sorts of thyroid cancer might include women in general. Um, a history of radiation directly to the head or neck region, um, perhaps while you were growing up um, or as a result of other procedures that you might have had in adolescence or young life. So um, in this country, um, uh, there used to be some radiation procedures done in sort of the older folks, the older generation, we don't do this anymore, for tonsils or for acne. Um, we haven't done this in this country for many, many decades, so I would be very surprised if someone had that done even, um, even as a history of that, probably in the 50s or the 40s, um, 1950s and 40s. <laughs> and uh, also, if there's a family history of thyroid cancer, there are some types of thyroid cancer that travel a little bit more frequently in certain families, but the majority of actually thyroid cancer is not inherited. Question. Uh, a CT scan or like an MRI or one of those radiology procedures, do they confer much radiation? Um, you know, we, we think that a single uh, study like that, a CAT scan, is probably not going to confer enough radiation to result in a thyroid cancer problem, but the risk is always there because it is some radiation, right? But I, the doses that I'm talking about are direct radiation to the thyroid in dedicated and perhaps frequently repeated doses over the course of perhaps another treatment for something else. So in general, um, radi radiologic procedures do not confer much risk um, if done only once or twice. <laughs> okay. So diagnosis of thyroid cancer. Um, this is initially found usually as a thyroid nodule, that lump or bump within the thyroid gland, either by palpation because your doctor felt it or you felt it, um, or because you had a CAT scan or other imaging that happened to look at the thyroid and we see a little bump in there. So um, the thyroid nodule biopsy is performed again for bumps or lumps that are fairly large, you know, one or one and a half centimeters, but only again, less than probably one in 10 or at most 15% um, of those will be an underlying thyroid cancer. Um, and then the thyroid cancer is confirmed by aspiration removal of a part of that thyroid nodule. Uh, the cells are sent down to pathology and they're confirmed um, by those results and then off you go for referral for thyroid surgery, removal of the entire thyroid gland. Excuse me. Yes, question. Oh, 
thyroid transplants. No, we don't have that um, currently, unfortunately, in this current era of medicine yet. All we can do is replace the thyroid hormone levels with the medications that we talked about for hypothyroidism. But um, once the thyroid is removed, it is removed. Okay, thank you for the question. So um, treatment for, for thyroid cancer, first step is that thyroid surgery using a you know, real surgery, making an incision um, in small cancers, it would be at most one or one and a half inches of a scar um, uh, that is well healed um, if done in a very good center by a very experienced surgeon, followed by perhaps consideration of radioactive iodine. Um, so the thought of radioactive iodine is that even in the best hands of the best surgeon in the entire world, there's gonna be probably small microscopic amounts of thyroid cells remaining in your neck um, that we just can't see. They're very, very small, they're microscopic, and those cells can be normal thyroid tissue, but they could also be part of that thyroid cancer that was removed. So for that reason, radioactive iodine might be considered in um, folks with more advanced thyroid cancer in which we want to give radiation and zap away any even microscopic amounts that might be remaining. Uh, because thyroid cancer can recur even up to 20, 30 years later. We want to sort of fix everything at the outset. Um, and then for advanced cancers, perhaps more metastatic disease, in which cancer has spread throughout the body, um, uh, thyroid surgery and radioactive iodine might have limited use. And so uh, very rarely for these advanced cancers, we would refer to an oncologist for chemotherapy. That's usually not done unless the situation is very, very advanced. Um, and then how do we monitor you? Um, it's done in combination with the endocrine surgery and the endocrinologist. But um, I usually like to see people at least once or twice a year after thyroid cancer, after their surgery, and perhaps even after the radioactive iodine. We look at a combination of blood tests because we can actually test for that thyroid protein through a very simple blood test and or a combination of neck imaging um, to see structurally if anything has recurred. Um, thyroid surgery, just in, in uh, answer to this previous question, it is performed under general anesthesia, usually requires one overnight stay, best performed by a surgeon with a lot of experience and at a center with high volume. Um, remember the, the, the potential um, uh, uh, side effects that it can occur with thyroid surgery, so that's potential damage to the parathyroid glands, the four on the two on the right, two on the left, that are controlling the way our body utilizes calcium, not related to the thyroid gland at all, except it has some similarity in its name, and or the vocal cords, which are also in the area of the thyroid. So irritation of the, temp uh, of the vocal cords might give you temporary hoarseness. Again, the major complications should occur in a good center with a good surgeon less than 1% of the time. And again, permanent hypothyroidism will require lifelong thyroid hormone replacement. Okay, um, uh, this is again just a reminder of radioactive iodine treatment for thyroid cancer. We already talked about this for the treatment of Graves' disease, so I'm not gonna talk about it in great detail. But as a reminder, it, can, it, it should be considered also in patients with a history of thyroid cancer as well to zap away those remaining thyroid cancer cells that might be there microscopically. The prognosis of thyroid cancer is usually quite good if it's um, found early um, and in lower stages. So this is, pertains to people who might be young and we define um, thyroid cancer staging for um, you know, types of age as less than 45 years old, usually gives you stage one if it's confined to the thyroid. Um, patients with small cancers to begin with, which are more um, usually a co more completely resected and removed by the thyroid surgery. Papillary thyroid cancers of all the thyroid cancer subtypes are probably the ones that are uh, the ones that confer the best prognosis because they tend to be confined to the thyroid gland itself and not spread. Um, and then in fact, patients with low stage disease, stage one disease, um, have a 100% survival at 10 years. So really, in, the, in, in a good center that's 
treating um, all the aspects of thyroid cancer well, it really should have no impact on your life and mortality. Okay, so in summary, I tried to really um, uh, go over uh, in brief uh, what hypothyroidism is, and it's an underactive thyroid, re requires thyroid hormone replacement probably for the rest of your life. Hyperthyroidism is an uh, overactive thyroid gland. The most common cause is Graves' disease and autoimmune disease, and some folks might have thyroid eye disease from the Graves' disease. So that excess thyroid hormone should be treated to be removed to take away the stress in your heart and your bones. Thyroid nodules are lumps physically in the thyroid, usually with no effect on thyroid hormone production. Um, and the majority of them are benign, not cancerous. Um, but if thyroid cancer happens to be found in the little thyroid lump, the nodule, treatment of surgery and possibly radioactive iodine as a follow-up are recommended. So I hope I've gone through the entire spectrum of what thyroid disease is, both thyroid dysfunction as well as thyroid lumps and cancer. I'm happy to take any questions, and thank you very much for your time. I have a question up front. Yes. Do you have any literature at all or a card? I have a few cards I'm happy to provide, um, and I can give you that at the end. It was so thorough. I'm glad. I'm glad it was clear. Doctors don't have the time. <laughs> This is why we come to a setting like this, because we're not rushed in the clinic. <laughs> okay, question in the back. Okay, yeah, the type of, of surgeon that does thyroid surgeries, there are many. Um, th uh, general surgeons do do thyroid surgery. Um, if it's but you know, I work at the UCLA Endocrine Center, um, and in the same office are dedicated endocrine surgeons. So the only type of surgeries they do are for endocrine diseases, mostly the thyroid and the parathyroid. So um, you know, generally it is recommended to go to a center um, and to a person with a lot of experience, and that might be defined as an endocrine surgeon. Um, also, uh, physicians that are years, nose, throat doctors or otolaryngologists also do thyroid surgery. Um, so depending on where you are in the community and where, which physician you are working with, or endocrinologist, they might refer you to different folks. Yes. Um, good question. In the case of a thyroid nodule and surgery is the option, is just that nodule removed or is the whole thyroid? Oh, good question. Um, so the question is, if we have a suspicious or even a proven thyroid cancer by biopsy, um, removal of some of the cells of that nodule and you know a thyroid surgery is recommended how much of the thyroid is usually resected or removed um, it depends really everything depends <laughs> on uh, the size of that thyroid nodule um, and also if we notice that it might have spread to surrounding lymph nodes in the area because usually that's the first root of spread it surrounds uh, it goes into the surrounding tissues the fat the muscles um, you know, uh, et cetera, but then it goes outside of the thyroid into the lymph nodes of the body. Lymph nodes are very common. We always, you know, our lymph nodes are good. They help us fight infection, um, but those are the, also the, the, the structures in which thyroid cancer might go first. So depending if we see a large lymph node and we biopsy even the lymph node, we prove that it's spread outside to the lymph node, then it's more of a uh, more extensive surgery. So. Um, only in the setting uh, of no lymph node involvement and the thyroid cancer is very, very small, um, confined to one side without any other nodules all over the thyroid gland might a thyroid surgeon consider only taking half of the thyroid gland. But it makes it really difficult to monitor for recurrence because we are unable to then use the thyroid blood test to figure out if the thyroid cancer came back because you do have a little bit of normal thyroid tissue remaining, so that blood test is irrelevant. Um, and so we can only rely on a very good and careful ultrasound to see if it has come back. That might miss things. Question. I have a question. I'm having difficulty swallowing sometimes, not all the time, but I've got to go have it checked. Yes, trouble swallowing. That was one of the symptoms of a thyroid nodule. If it becomes big enough, it can interfere with breathing, talking, swallowing, talking, et cetera. So it's not a bad idea to go get it palpated or at least ultrasounded even um, to see if there is a structure there that's in the way. Question here. Um, one of the few things I did hear about low thyroid, not even from my doctor even this, was that it is more common now among well, 
Well, so we're talking about is underactive thyroid or hypothyroidism becoming increasingly common? Um, I think perhaps not. Um, I think we're getting better at diagnosing it. Um, we're paying more attention to it. But if you look at the trends of an overactive thyroid gland, it still has remained probably less than 5% of the general population for now even old, old studies, um, and they're the same rates now. Underactive thyroid gland, yeah, less than 5%, depending on the series. Um, so, you know, the big, uh, there's a big study a couple decades ago, Colorado, at a health fair. That percent, I believe, was about 4, four point something percent, and that figure has generally remained the same. So, we're probably paying more attention to it. Um, I looked at causes, it's possible causes of uh, hypothyroidism. The causes of hypothyroidism, yes. yes. Um, so good question. What if you don't have one of the listed causes of an underactive thyroid gland? Um, and that could be very, very, very true and common. Um, and we just call that that's an, uh, we just call that uh, sort of in the other category. So it's just called regular hypothyroidism. Um, and sometimes we can't find a reason, but the treatment is still the same. Yeah, that's actually quite common as well. Question. For a suspicious large nodule to spontaneously get much smaller? Oh, do nodule sizes decrease over time? Usually not, unless there are those types that are fluid filled completely. So like a little water balloon, the cyst that I was talking about, because you can imagine the water moves in and out of the thyroid cyst. Um, but for solid structures, they generally either stay the same or they can grow. And that's why we monitor you with a thyroid ultrasound every so often, you know, probably once a year, um, to make sure that that size has at least stayed the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we're out of time. Thank you so much for everyone's attention.